What is going on, everyone? Welcome to Barking for Balance, the podcast where we talk about dogs, but we talk about whatever it is that is meant to teach, inspire, and entertain. This podcast platform is literally about all sorts of cool stuff. So if you're wondering who I am, I am Pat the Pac-Man, dog behavior and rehabilitation specialist at Pac-Man to the Rescue. What we do is we train people, not dogs. That's the important thing, guys. Train people, not dogs. And if you have heard this podcast before, if you know me, then you know that that's what we do. And if you have not, if you have not listened to this podcast before, then make sure you subscribe. Guys, come on. What have you been waiting for? What are you waiting for? Mike, get fuck. I speak talo, Adriano. Yes, I do speak Sicilian as well because I was living. I used to live in Sicily for seven years from the age of 10 to 17. So I love speaking Sicilian. We're going to be talking Sicilian quite a bit around here. You're going to learn some phrases, some words, but again, getting back to why haven't you subscribed to the podcast yet? What are you waiting for? What do you want a gift? Come on now, make sure you subscribe. Uh, the podcast is on Google podcast, Apple podcast, Spotify, Amazon, and on YouTube. If you want to see the good looking face that I have right here upon my head. Anyway, listen, I told you right off the bat, I always say it right off the bat, the podcast that is meant to teach, inspire, and entertain. And I say that for a reason, because by golly, geez, that's what we do here. That's what we do. There may be some curse words in Italian and in English and in Sicilian, if you have sensitive ears, you're going to have a problem with that. But this is the podcast. So come on, guys. Don't waste any more time. Subscribe. I'll repeat it later. Subscribe. Listen to the podcast. Today, I want to talk about something very, very, very important. Again, the goal, my mission in life as to why I do this is because I want to train people. I want to educate humans in making them understand what dogs need. We do not care about well-trained dogs. Well-trained dogs, well-trained dogs, every dog is well-trained, guys. Every dog is well-trained. That's why we want to train people, not train dogs, because a well-trained dog owner will make sure that their dog is being provided the stuff that they need in order to be happy, fulfilled, and well-behaved. So I ask you this question. Do you want a dog that's well-trained? Or do you want a dog that's happy, fulfilled, and well-behaved? Hmm? Because the difference is dramatically huge. They are two different things. So you could always have a dog that's well-trained if you have them happy, well happy. You know, when I get when I get on a roll, this is what ends up happening is I start talking really, really, really fast. And I get really, really like excited because I love this stuff. This stuff is like, this is my purpose in life. You know what I'm saying? It's to educate people about dogs so we could save the dog world make them happy, fulfilled, and well-behaved. Because again, like I was saying before, or was trying to say, before I got all mumbled up, the, what I was trying to tell you was a dog that is happy, fulfilled, and well-behaved is automatically well-trained. Bottom line. If you want to know more about that, what the hell that means, let me know. And I will be glad to, to share that, those thoughts on, with you. So, um, so yeah, so on that purpose of educating dog owners, and providing dog owners the knowledge, the proper knowledge necessary to achieve that goal. I'm going to try to slow down for you guys. Cause like I said, I get really excited. I'm passionate about this stuff. And so I get really, really excited. I start talking really fast. And that leads me into the two topics that I really want to get involved with today. I really want to talk about today. And the big topic here is excitement is the root of all evil. My clients hear this all the time. Excitement is the root of all evil. I have I have a bunch of different sayings and, and slogans and mantras and all sorts of stuff. But this one's an important one, guys. Excitement is the root of all evil. What does that mean? Stay tuned. You're going to find that in a second. But before we get to that, I'm just kidding. So no commercial, no commercial breaks here, at least not yet. Um, so yeah, excitement is the root of all evil. We're going to talk about excitement. Excitement is the problem. Excitement is the by the reason why 99.9% .9 of behavior problems exist. Okay. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is crate training. You know, there's a little, a lot of um, issues. People have a lot of problems with crates, uh, when to use them, why to use them, if to use them. And people have a lot of, of, of adverse, you know, uh, opinions and viewpoints about crates and, and what they represent and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to talk about crates. You know, I'm going to give you my, my personal, um, tips on, you know, how to, you know, make sure that you integrate and you teach your dog to be properly crate trained, but also believe it or not, guys, crates are also key factor. It's a great tool 
for the battle against excitement. You know what I'm saying? So let's dive into this excitement. Now, as you could tell, when I start talking, I get really excited and I get all crazy and I get all excited and I get all hyped up, right? So I'm sure that you've seen dogs that are in that same situation. So people often misinterpret uh, an excited dog for a happy dog. They are two completely different things. Now, excitement is a state of mind, right? So excitement and happiness are two different things, meaning that the example I always give my clients is this. If you have a child that's in a restaurant and that child is screaming at the top of their lungs, running around, bumping into waiters, knocking over chairs, bumping, you know, knocking over plates of food, just going nuts. Is that excitement or is that happiness? If you said happiness, then you're wrong. If you said excitement, you are correct. Ding, ding. Now, is that acceptable? Is that not acceptable? If you said it's, 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 it's exact. Okay. If you said that that behavior is acceptable, well, then we got all sorts of other shitty problems. We have all sorts of other issues to deal with. So that behavior is unacceptable. You know what I'm saying? That behavior is unacceptable and it stems from excitement. That child is excited and therefore they're finding an outlet, a way to release that excitement. So when I say that excitement is the root of all evil, I mean that excitement is the root of all evil. All problems stem from excitement, including, you ready for this one? Aggression. Yes. An aggressive dog, a dog that bites a lot of times can be from excitement. A lot of dog aggression issues like pure, like real aggression issues, they stem from excitement. You don't want to believe it? There's people that don't want to believe it. It's all about fear. It's about genetics. It's a believe what you want. The fact of the matter is that the state of mind of the dog is what causes the behavior. The, the outcome of that is the cause from the state of mind. It's really the, 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 you know, the reality of the fact. So if we address the state of mind, that the dog is in, whatever it is, in this case, we're talking about excitement. If we address the state of mind that the dog is in, what ends up happening is we cure, yes, you heard me, cure a boatload, una bella salatera of bad, of bad behavior that you're trying to get rid of. So dog training tactics. And as if you've listened to this podcast before, you know how I feel about that dog training crap. So dog training techniques, address the outcome. Basically, so for example, we'll use a couple of different things. Jumping, you know, a dog jumps on a person when you first walk into the house. Okay. So when the dog jumps on, on the person, a dog trainer who's applying dog training techniques will use treats, a lot of words. Okay. A lot of commands. And it'll be looking like with the treat in their hand, sit, sit, sit. Oh, you're such a good boy. Oh, you're such a, yeah. Oh, good. Good. Now the, 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 objective that these individuals, these more, I mean, these people, and <laughs> these people, I'm telling you, this is how it ends up going. So we're going to have a podcast dedicated exclusively to this because I really have to get it done. I just, I just have to get myself in the right mindset because I'm going to be going off on this whole shit. But anyway, so um, the, 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 the purpose that what the objective that these people have is to not let the dog jump. Now, here's the problem. At what point do we address the reason why the dog was jumping? Okay. So what is the reason why the dog is jumping? And I mean, there's other additional factors to a dominance, lack of you know manners, whatever you want to call it. But the main culprit is if you said excitement, you guessed it. If you said something else, then you got to pay attention. You know what I'm saying? Attention, you know, <laughs> that's really the reality of it. So a dog that jumps is a by is, is the jumping is not the problem the excitement that causes the jumping because a dog that's excited will release that excitement in a variety of different ways because they have all this pent-up excitement all this pent-up uh, this pent -up, you know it's like somebody that's on caffeine it's just they're all hyped up they're all hyped up and they need an outlet to release all that pent-up energy so some dogs bark some dogs jump some dogs dig some dogs chew some dogs bite some dogs attack it depends on which outlet and how they choose to release all that pent-up excitement make sense have any questions let me know so that's really the bottom line to how this all gets started so the the byproduct of the excitement is 
what we were talking about in this example was jumping. So how do we address in the dog trainer mentality, we addressing the jumping. So again, in this person's mind, their objective is to not let the dog jump. So as long as the butt of the dog is on the ground, they don't care. They'll reward that with treats. But here's the problem. What you just rewarded and nurtured was excitement. Okay. So you just told this dog, what I like is when you're excited. So as long as the dog is excited, yeah, they're not jumping, but now it becomes what I call the bribery system. Because if you don't got even squat in, in, in your hands, if you don't have cookies in your hands, then this dog will continuously jump and do other things because what you just asked of him or her is I like it when you're excitement, when you're excited. So being a dog, dogs want to please us. They want to do more of what it is that we ask of them. Therefore, if we ask them to be excited and we reward that excitement and we nurture that excitement, guess what they're going to do? Give us more of that. So they become more excited. The other factor is that now, again, based on that bribery system, that dog is going to be telling you and anybody else that walks through the door, hey, listen, buddy, you don't give me a cookie. I'm releasing this. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping all over you. And now the excitement plus the jumping creates an excited dominant state of mind. Make sense? And now all sorts of other stem, all the sorts of other behaviors start to take place, right? I know people don't believe it. The dominant theory, dogs are not dominant. Look, we'll get into that another time. I don't want to get into this. Dogs do behave dominantly. In the human mind, dominance is not um, an acceptable behavior, an, an acceptable state of mind, an acceptable act in the animal world. It absolutely is because in the human world, dominance equals ego. That's the truth. People become dominant because of ego. Animals do not. It's just a hierarchy of authority. It's just nature instincts, pure and simple, but because people just don't understand that they put their own emotions ahead of the dogs, whatever. We'll get into that. Not trouble with not, not trouble with anyway. So going back to the excitement. So using the, the jumping as, as the example still here, if you are, are creating this sense of excitement with your dog, and then you're rewarded with affection, with food, with attention, that's really what's causing the problem. It's the jumping is not being fixed until you fix the source. Because like I said, if you have a dog that's jumping, barking, chasing, you know, digging, uh, biting, attacking, whatever your problems are, those are all byproducts of the same thing, excitement. So if we get rid of the excitement, then all that crap goes away. The saluto, guy, get fired, goodbye. All that stuff is gone. Yes, it's really that simple. So we have to focus on state of mind, right? Now, excitement is caused by us, by people, because first and foremost, we don't necessarily physically and or mentally stimulate our dogs by draining their physical and mental energy, either properly or at all. So I'll give you an example. A lot of people think that walking, first of all, you have to understand that dogs are working creatures. They require something to do. They need a job, basically. That's why we have a bunch of different variety of, of, of options on how we could drain the mental and defense and physical energy, but also make them fulfilled. See what I'm saying? I said this before. What's the goal? Being For us to make our dogs happy, fulfilled, well-behaved. That's the trifecta. In order to do that, we have to cater to, again, their needs. Take yourself out of your own egotistical shoes. You have to provide what they need, not what you think they need or what they, you think they want. Respect the dogness, guys. Respect their dogness. Physical and mental stimulation is the key. So, and if you have any questions on how to get that done, we could definitely talk about that. I have some videos on YouTube uh, and some podcasts also where I talk about that. So if we, we drain the mental and the physical energy by providing them a job, by fulfilling the instincts as a dog and as a breed, now, the other thing is that we have to make sure that by doing so, we are providing an outlet that gives our dogs something to understand what it is that we want from them in order to get what it is that they want from us, right? So going back to the whole jumping example, if we want our dog to not jump on us, we have to do what? Make sure that they're not excited. Actually, you know what? I lost my three hundred thought. 
a ah, vecchiaia, a ah, vecchiaia na carogna, seven and nana trashata. So I was actually going to talk about, you know, something about the, 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 the work example, but you know what? I'll get to that in, in a second. So um, let me finish this point now. So I'm all over the place, barking for balance. That's what happens on this podcast. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, I remember now. You guys paying attention? I hope you're paying attention because if you're not, pay attention. Okay. So if you have a dog that is, um, that you walk, when you walk in the door, right, and you're greeting them with a lot of excitement, right, you are basically telling that dog you want them to be excited. Now, you can't expect your dog to respect your guests walking through the door because you already have taught them that when somebody walks through that big tri that big rectangle, automatically we become excited, right? So it starts from you and you have to learn how to not trigger that excitement because you can't expect them to behave differently with others when you're teaching them to behave a certain way with you. It just makes no sense, you know? Consistency, guys, consistency. So the bottom line is this. Going back to my other point. Okay, so we're going to get back to this. So a lot of people, again, from the mental and physical stimulation standpoint, because everybody knows that old saying, a tired dog is a good dog. In theory, sure. But the fact of the matter is, a calm dog is a good dog. And again, tired is physical, calm is mental. And we could teach a dog to be calm. And if you want to learn more about that, let me know. We could talk more in depth about that. But this is actually one of the things that, that will help. The physical aspect where, you know, the, the basic way to physically drain a dog's energy is walking. You take them on a walk, you put a leash. I know, oh my God, oh, I'll put that coming out. I know it's a, it, it's a it, you know, we're lazy. We go to the gym for two hours, but God forbid we take our dog for a walk. Anyway, so here's, here's the thing. What most people misinterpret is the fact that they believe that they are going to drain a dog's energy by performing certain activities that are actually excitement driven activities. They're not energy draining activities, such as running around the backyard. And I'll he and I hear this all the time. This dog is barking, this dog is biting, this dog is this, this dog is that. And I already know it's a byproduct of excitement. And the first question I ask is, do you walk your dog? And the answer becomes, no, my particular foot of No, it's I, I, he runs around the backyard. <sighs> running around the backyard. I talk about this on one of my YouTube videos, guys. I talk about this on, 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 on probably on numerous podcasts. You know what I'm saying? What, running around the backyard is playtime. It's an excitement driven activity. That's why they're not draining that energy. They're not being fulfilled because it's just crazy. They're just, they're just going to Chuck E. Cheese running around, just going crazy. Oh my God, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. You know what I'm saying? Another thing is the walking. Now, can you take your dog out for a walk? for an hour and come back and absolutely be no, not productive at all, where I hear this again all the time. And I'm sure you guys tell me if you are experiencing that, or if you know somebody that, that experiences that, where you take your dog out on a long walk, a couple of hours, even, you know, I've heard people that go out, take their dog out for like a couple of hours walk. The dog comes back bouncing off the walls. I don't understand. This dog is so high energy. He's just bouncing off the walls. And of course, the first question I ask is, how is he walking? Does he zigzag? Is he chasing stuff? Is he looking for things? Is he nose to the ground the whole time? And they'll say, yeah. Okay. So that particular walk is physical, correct? So we are out there for an hour, two hours, whatever the case may be, is the physical act of walking. But here's the problem, guys. The act of walking is not helping because the brain never went into a working mode. The brain doesn't go into an energy draining mode. The brain is in an excited mode. It's looking for stuff. It's picking up a scent. Oh my God, what is that? They see something. Oh my God, let me go after that. Oh, there's a squirrel. Let me chase after that. You see how that's all excitement? You see what I'm saying? So that walk is actually not draining any energy, not draining the excitement. It's increasing the energy. It's increasing the excitement. Does that make sense? Right? You see what you see what I'm saying with this? Right? so make up it. You starting to get enlightened. I could see you guys. You guys are like, oh, I'm a Pac-Man guy. He's pretty smart. He's not bad looking either, but he's pretty smart. You know, he knows his shit. Who's up big into gifa? I hope you're saying that at least. And if you're not, say it. Okay. So if you're taking your dog on a walk and your dog is not productive, that walk is not productive, your dog is not is not achieving the goals of what you're supposed to be doing, right? what you're supposed to be providing him. That walk again is meant for a purpose, which is to drain the mental and physical. Now, like it, look, 
the walking has other purposes too, but the main one in this case is drain the mental and the physical energy. I'm trying not to like sway because I tend to do that. You know, you guys have been listening to this. You know that I all of a sudden I go into a tangent about something else. So I'm going to try to stay on track. I want to really focus on this. This is an important topic, guys, because again, excitement is the root of all evil. I'm going to make t-shirts on that. Don't be, don't be stealing my shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I want to trademark all my, all, my, all my sayings. And if you guys know actually an attorney that does trademarks or how to get that stuff done, let me know. You could do that online or some shit. Just let me know because I really want to trademark all my sayings and all my mantras and stuff before somebody steals them. But see the latte, see the latte. Okay. So getting back to excitement. So now when you take your dog out for this long one hour walk, the way I always explain it is like this. Yes, you're out for an hour. For two, let's call it two hours. You're out for two hours. You're thinking, well, you know, this guy, this dog is going to be coming home, drained. The energy is going to be tight. He's going to be exhausted. Here's the thing. If the brain doesn't go into working mode, if you're not using that walk productively, if you don't drain it properly, then that's two hours that you just wasted. And I always equal this to, some, to, to this. If you go to the gym for two hours and you do an exercise and then you play with your phone for 10 minutes, and then you do another exercise and you're talking to so-and-so for 15 minutes. And then you do another exercise and you watch the TV for 10 minutes. Yes, you're at the gym for two hours, but you're not working for two hours. For same, so make sense? That's the thing. That's the secret. So by understanding those principles, what ends up happening is that you realize how sometimes, if not always, when you use the, that time productively, you could shrink the amount because you put the brain and the body together, working in conjunction, draining massive energy, establishing directions, bounds, and limits. And now you are fulfilling your dog's dogness. You're respecting your dog's dogness. You're providing your dog what they need. And then in turn, they'll provide you what you need. Now it's not a selfish relationship. Now it's not a one-sided relationship. This way they won't divorce you and run away. That's why I always say, that's probably why dogs just take off and they're like going somewhere else because they're like, I had enough of this shit. I got to be gone with these people. You know what I mean? So I'm sure that's not the case, but you know, but they're not being provided what they need. Listen, everybody loves their dogs. Well, let me phrase that. Most people love their dogs, but they, they love them the wrong way. I respect that, guys. Listen, don't believe that I feel, you know, you can't love your dog. I love my dog. Socks and pepper are my world. You know what I mean? But I also love them for a reason. And I love them just like most people love dogs for a reason. And that's because they're different than people. But unfortunately, we treat them in a different way. And we treat them more like us, which means we are treating them like humans, which means that we are not respecting what they are. If anything, we try to make them more like human or see them more like human, where to be honest, we love dogs because of their qualities that they possess, all the qualities that they possess that are different than humans. So what baffles me all the time is that why is it that we try to make dogs like humans? And if anything, we should try to be more like dogs because let's face it, guys, humans suck. You know what I'm saying? If you don't agree with that, well, whatever, but that's how it works. So we should try to be more like dogs. This world would be a whole other world if we were more like dogs, for God's sakes. You know what I'm saying? I mean, give a make up it. Sit there, koi dono. You you agree? I would love to hear your input on that, guys. So again, I people love their dogs. You know what I'm saying? I never have to teach people to love their dogs, how to reward them. Never have to do that. I never tell somebody you love your dog too much. Absolutely not. The more, the better. But I do teach people when to love their dogs, how to love their dogs. You know what I mean? Because love channeled in the wrong direction is a problem. You know, a lot of times we become enablers to the behavior. Sometimes it's out of ignorance. Sometimes it's out of stupidity. Sometimes it's because we have the, the improper knowledge, you know? So I never have to teach my clients to love their dogs. I mean, Jesus Christ. They, it's by the, by the boatload and I'm never going to tone it down. Listen, you're never going to tone my love for my, for my babies, you know, socks and pepper, never, not even, not don't even try it, but I love them as what they are. And I respect them as what they are. You know what I mean? And so that's really when you love a dog the right way. Does that make sense? You know, because everybody like loves their dogs the wrong way. And unfortunately that is what causes problems, you know, respect the dog's dogness guys. You know, so if you want to know more about that, let me know. If you disagree, you agree, please share those, those opinions. 
But um, so, yeah, so getting back to excitement. So now, again, we're talking about people in the backyard, right? Running around the backyard. We're talking about the walk being done improperly. So, yeah, these people are putting in some time and effort, but they're not understanding the connection until you point it out. Some people, because if you think about it, it makes sense. I'm out for an hour. That's, that's a lot. How come this doesn't drain the energy? Dog runs around throwing the ball. That's again, it's excitement driven activity. Now, if you have a specific dog, we'll talk about throwing the ball here, right? If you have a specific dog, like a retriever, golden retriever, Labrador retriever, those guys fetch stuff, right? Now, if you just throw the ball willy nilly, is that a mentally stimulating, physically stimulating activity? Or is that playtime? If you said that's playtime, you are correct. Now, if you want to make that activity, which in that particular breed is exactly what is necessary to make them fulfilled as a breed, then the one thing you have to add to that is simple. There's got to be rules. If you put rules in place for that, that particular activity, then all of a sudden, now you are fulfilling the dog, you are fulfilling the breed, and they're happy. You're giving them exactly what it is that they want. You know what I'm saying? So you can't just throw the ball around and expect the well, others is going to tire them out. No, because it's playtime. You know what I'm saying? So you could, you, you got to understand the mentality of the dog. You got to understand the brain of a dog, you know? So excitement is what causes this. I'm sorry. Excitement is the byproduct of this because we're increasing it. We're building it up, but with no outlet to release it. You know what I'm saying? So you also have a situation where dogs can become quote unquote aggressive. And again, if you experienced this before, or if you know somebody who's experiencing this, please share this. So you have a dog who is just not being exercised properly, not being walked, not being, you know, um, you know, fulfilled, running around the backyard, basically no rules, right? No, no direction, bounds and limits, just a free for all. And then tons of reward, food, affection, toys, treats, again, running around, playing, excitement driven activities. So what ends up happening is because there's no productive outlet, now, this is only one of the reasons why this happens. There's no productive outlet for this dog to release this pent-up excitement, this pent-up energy. What ends up happening is that the bits builds, 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 and then boom, it's an explosion, right? And a lot of times that explosion is perceived as aggression. Let's say you have another dog in the house and that dog, they get along with no problems. Everything is cool. And then all of a sudden, bam, this dog just attacks, rips this other dog apart the whole bit. And then everything is calm. Months go by, and then another attack. Months go by, and then another attack. And what you're noticing is that every single time there's an attack or an explosion, as I call it, each one intensifies. Each one is at a greater intensity. Why is that? Simple. Because what ends up happening is that that explosion is necessary to basically empty out the tank, right? And then it starts to build, 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 boom, explosion, and then the tank is empty, and then it builds, builds, and that's really the pattern, right? But again... Is that dog aggressive? Does that dog have genetics? Because that's what dog trainers will make you believe, right? They don't know shit about this stuff. Okay, I'm going to the tangent. They don't know shit about it. They don't know nothing about So they have to make excuses. You know, they can't say, well, I don't know about this stuff. No, they make excuses. It's genetic. It's, it's because you didn't do this when they were. Basically, they'll make you feel as if you screwed up and there's no other option. That's basically what will happen. This is the way it is. You have no other choice. Therefore, the dog gets returned or put down. Pisses me off. Okay, we don't want to talk about that. But again, get it? Get, you understand the point? Excitement is the root of all evil. Okay? A dog that's digging up the yard. Think about it. Jumping. Barking. It's a way to release the excitement. If you have a dog that's constantly looking out the window, they're on alert. They're paying attention. They're not relaxing. So you're not making your dog mentally calm. So you're not teaching your dog to be calm. You're teaching your dog to be what? Excited because they're on alert. They're looking. Oh, what the hell is that? Is that a, who's, who's this person? Oh, let me bark at him. Let me scare. Him. Oh, there's a dog. Let me scare. Him. Oh, there's a squirrel. I want to chase after that squirrel. Constant excitement. You know what I'm saying? And then you wonder why there's a byproduct of your person comes in the door and you bite them. You know, they tear apart the furniture. They bark incessantly. That's the byproduct of excitement. Does this all make sense, guys? Does, I mean, am I making sense? Does this make sense? So simple. That's really the problem. So do not encourage excitement. Don't encourage it. 
you know, because otherwise you're going to become an enabler and you're the one who's causing the problems that you're trying to get rid of. So we fix the root of the problem. We fix the problem. Okay. We fix the reason for the behavior because all these fancy techniques to get rid of the jumping and the barking, it's really easy to do. You focus on the problem and the problem is in this case is excitement. You got it. Okay. So brings me to my point of the crate and why the crate is such a valuable tool as a puppy even as an older dog, you know, now, um, my dogs, socks and pepper, um, they're in their crates at now, uh, and now at this stage of the game, only when I'm not home. And the only reason why I choose to put them in their crates, obviously there's other rationale. Now they're, they're at a stage now because we don't, you know, they're not going to have these kind of issues, which I'm going to get to in a second. But the main reason why I personally like them in their crates when I'm not home is purely for safety purposes, meaning God forbid there's a fire or whatever, you bust down the doors, grab the crates, you're out. All, all my animals are in enclosures. So you just have to grab their enclosures, take them out. And that's really what makes me, um, gives me peace of mind when I'm not home that again, God forbid, you know. Now the key to this obviously is the crate has to be, um, has to have a calming place because I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, my dog hates to be in the crate. Well, we're going to get to that in a second, but the reason why they hate being in the crate is because you just didn't do it right. You didn't associate it right, or you gave up too soon. Uh, most of the time, it's, it's maybe a combination of the two, but you know, the crate is a great tool because what I call it, I call it a calming box because when they go in their crates, the purpose of them being in their crates is exclusively to be what? Calm. That's right. So again, going back to what I've been saying this whole time, if you haven't been paying attention, you got to pay attention and also reminding you if you haven't done it yet, come on guys, what are you waiting for? Spotify, Apple podcasts, Google, Amazon, and YouTube subscribe to the podcast. Don't miss out on barking for balance. You want to hear the Pac-Man. I'm full of knowledge, full of funniness, full of great stuff. Okay. So I had to throw that in there, but the calming, the crate is a calming box. It's meant to keep the brain of a dog calm. So we're teaching them to be calm. Now, here's the thing. When you first start crate training, the reason why most of the time the dog associates a crate in a negative way, it's because you use it as punishment, right? The other reason why is because of the fact that you never um, associate anchor calmness with the crate, right? So here's just a couple of ideas, just a couple of tidbits that I use and I've used with my own clients, but especially with Socks and Pepper and their crates. Listen, their crates are phenomenal. They're, they're, they're like little, little New York city apartments for these guys. You know, they got their little memory foam beds in there. You know, they got, um, blankets. So they like to snuggle in there. They create like little pillow socks, create like creates like a little pillow out of he likes, he's like a person. He sleeps like on a pillow. Even on the bed, he just sleeps on a pillow. He likes his head propped up. Uh, Pepper likes to dig in. She's part dachshund. So she likes to like, you know, dig herself under the blanket and stuff. So they got blankets in there, memory foam beds. Those mattresses are hardcore awesome. So I was I should go. I should go sleep in there sometimes. Anyway, so, so the crates, they have a positive association with their crates. And again, I only use them now when I'm not home, when, I'm, when nobody's home. But um that I used to use them throughout the day, but you know, if you got to know, if you want to know more about crate training, which we'll, we'll, we could talk to them more extensively right now, I just want to explain how the crate associates with the getting rid of the excitement factor. So again, when you're introducing a dog to your, to a crate, the most important thing that you have to do is not to number one, use food. Don't use, again, the bribery system is not smart, you know, because again, if you're bringing out treats and you're bringing out food, what state of mind are you triggering? Yes. If you said excitement, you've been paying attention. If you haven't, drop it to Lloyd, get real speed, get to have an energy drink or something, slap yourself in the face, wake up. Yes, you're triggering excitement because food makes them excited. So you want to use the treat as a reward for going in the crate. And my point of it is you don't want to, you don't want to lure them in with a treat. Okay. You don't want to throw a treat in there and then look, dog runs in and you close the door. That's called a trap. Okay. So now you're trapping, you're bringing a dog in the crate with an excited mindset. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to bark. They're going to destroy. They're going to like rip the bed apart because of the fact that they never went in calmly. Okay. So the most important thing when you're bringing a dog into a crate is what I call 50, 50 approach. Meaning your job is to give their, their give them direction. Their job is to follow that those directions. 
So if you're bringing your dog into the crate, the first couple of times to teach them what you do is you br bring them to the crate. You could put their front paws in the crate if you'd like, give them a little nudge and let them walk in. Remember, if you put the dog into the crate, the brain never did anything. The dog never did anything. You want to explain to the dog physically and energy wise, your energy communicates your words. Stop yapping. Stop. Come on, let's go. Let's go get in there. Come on, let's go. Come on, get in there, get in there. Because again, if you go into that mode where you're doing that much talking, what energy are you in? And if you said excitement, you got that right. Ding, ding, ding. That's the point. So now you're spiking up the excitement because you're excited. So now the crate equals excitement. Hasem so oh. So now when you are getting your dog in the crate, the uh, and you're struggling with it, maybe they're backing up, maybe they're fighting you or whatever. Remember, it's 50-50. You give direction. And at first it's going to be a little more difficult because your dog's little, you know, they're not understanding. If they're puppies, it's going to be a little bit easier. If they're older dogs, maybe, you know, you got your, your job is to teach, right? And this brings me to my other point of, of frustration and anger, right? Because if you become frustrated or angry, again, as you're trying to let, teach your dog to go in the crate, what emotion are you triggering? If you said excitement, you got that right. Because yes, anger equals excitement in a dog. Because people don't understand that excitement is also angry. Anger. You know what I mean? Have you guys ever seen the movie Goodfellas? If you haven't, what the hell? Come on, go watch the Goodfellas. But before, subscribe to the podcast, Barking for Balance. Okay. So if you have not seen, if you've seen Goodfellas, so Goodfellas, you know, Robert De Niro's character, this is after, I'm not going to spoil too much of it, but basically after the Lufthansa heist, I'm sure most people have seen, you know, Goodfellas. So if you have not, then you may want to like mute this for like a couple of minutes until we get back. So, you know, after the Lufthansa heist, they're in the bar, they're celebrating. and Robert De Niro's character tells everybody, don't buy anything big, don't buy anything fancy because we don't want the cops to know what the hell's going on. So what ends up happening is that the one guy buys his wife a brand new pink Cadillac and shows up right in front of the bar. And of course, Robert De Niro's furious. He's pissed. He's screaming and he's cursing and he's just, he's just furious. So the guy says to him, if you don't remember, pay attention. He says to him, don't get excited. Why are you so excited? Now, Robert, if you know, seen the movie again, you know that Robert De Niro's character was not an excited guy. He's a dangerously mean guy. So was he excited? No, he was pissed. But again, why are you so excited? Don't get excited. You see what I'm saying? So again, the emotion translates to the dog as excitement. So again, excitement is the root of all evil. That's right. So take your time, be calm. We want our dog to be calm. We want our dog to associate crate with calmness, right? The only way they could do that if they have a, a source of that calmness and guess who that source is? Us, right? So now the use of the crate also means that if your dog has spike ups of excitement, as I call it. So in other words, you're starting off at a level zero of excitement. You're, he's around the house and now you know that he's starting to spike up one, two, three, four, five. If you don't control that escalation, then the intensity of that excitement will reach there's no cap. It just continues to skyrocket. It just continues to go up. Okay. And that's the problem because at some point they're going to stabilize at that high level, because that's really what you're teaching them is that this high level is what I want you to be at. Right. So now when you're starting to get this spike up of excitement, one, two, three, four, five, you have to make sure that you cap it. And that's what the crate is for. You use your, your crate to cap the excitement, but you have to cap it at a low level. You can't cap it at a high level because again, then you're trapping this excitement and they're just going to explode barking. You know, you know, th there's always going to be a little bit of barking and whining and whatnot. But again, if you get it at a low level, it's not going to continue to sky to, to climb up because you blocked it. So then you ignore your dog. You let them be. If you're not feeding into that excitement, if you're not giving them attention, if you're not talking to them, if you're not screaming, if you're not feeding into that excitement, it's going to come down. You know what I'm saying? And then once the dog calms down and reaches a level zero, you let them out. And now the starting point is zero, right? So now they start to climb up one, two, three, four, five, whoop, whoop, back in the crate and you go in the crate and they come back down and then they come back out and then they go back in and then they spike up and you see it in this back and forth. So what you're teaching your dog is basically the limitation of the excitement level. I don't want you to get to this point. I want you to be at this point. Does this make sense? Right? And that's how useful your crate is. So you have to use it to your advantage. You can't use it sporadically because if you're not consistent, 
their behavior is never going to be consistent. Consistency is key, guys. You got to be consistent. So use your crate to your advantage because at the end of the day, it's one of the greatest tools you could have. And it's not a punishment. Don't use it as a punishment. It's not a jail cell. People see it as a jail cell. It's not. Dogs are den animals. They like enclosures. That's why a lot of dogs like hide, you know, like they hang out underneath desks or underneath tables. They like that little enclosure type system. You know what I'm saying? You want your, your dog to associate the crate with calmness, re relaxation. This way, they'll just go in there and just hang out. You know what I mean? And in the beginning, while you're teaching, you're also stabilizing that excitement. The spike ups, bam, block, bring it back down. Come back out, bam, block, bring it back down. And now your dog is learning what you want from them and how you want them to be. Make sense? This is what makes sense, guys. Ascenso, me capito, me capito. Oh, I hope this was, uh, this was good. I mean, there's a lot more to great training. And if you want to learn more, um, you know, let me know. I'll probably do a little bit more of a, of a podcast uh, about exclusive about great training in more depth. Um, but this is, this is just the, the, the concept behind the excitement. I wanted to relate the crate specifically to how to control excitement and how to teach, you know, how to teach, uh, how to, how to neutralize the excitement. Because at the end of the day, the main job is to teach our dogs to be calm. Okay. Triggering excitement guys is easy. You could trigger, you can make a dog excited in the blink of an eye. How about making a dog calm? That's a lot harder, isn't it? And if you're starting to understand the concept of excitement is the root of all evil, then you may get why it's more important to make your dog calm because at the end of the day, you can make them trigger that excitement. I always say excitement is like a light switch with a dimmer on it, right? You, you, yeah, you turn it on or off, you control the intensity. That's what excitement is. It's like a light switch with a dimmer on it. You gotta type, I trademark that line too, okay? You turn it on or off, you control the intensity because you don't want your dog to be at a level 10 when they're playing with like a smaller dog or a child, you know, especially when you have a bigger dog, like a pit bull, like socks, tone that down. Does that make sense guys? Uh, so I hope, uh, I hope it does because listen, this is really the, the, probably the most important thing that you can learn about dogs is that excitement is the root of all evil. It, it really is. It really is. And if you want to learn more about that, please let me know because this is really the most important thing or the top three, we'll call it, you know what I'm saying? But this is an important topic. And this is, this is, this is, this is big guys. This is huge. Okay. So um, yeah. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast. I'm not going to repeat where you already know where make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, let me know. If you want to be a guest on the podcast, I'm barking for balance. I'm barking for balance guest. Please hit me up. Let me know. I'd be more than happy to have you guys on here on here. And um, any questions, you know where to find me. I uh, hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Barking for Balance podcast because I am Pat the Pac-Man and I sure enjoy talking to you guys and sharing my wealth of knowledge. So um, again, thank you for joining. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Pac-Man, I'm out. Bye. Bye. <laughs>